welcome everyone and welcome at this uh, new session of the Asia Euro People's Forum. Uh, we have uh, in the past we have organized already a lot of uh, say webinars and uh, and even before we had, there was a virtual world we also organized conferences where we met each other live and we could uh, say uh, discuss uh, for a long time together and eh? sometimes I remember and we were in Kuala Lumpur uh, in 2019 uh, with 25 say uh, also so uh, human rights activists and in fact the fact uh, the, the very fact that we have this uh, webinar here was in fact the idea was a bit born uh, during that uh, conference where we uh, we brought together many human rights activists and we we uh, we really uh, say we saw this um, the, the harassment of uh, human rights uh, defenders uh, and human rights activists, we saw this really as something that is a trend uh, throughout Europe and Asia and also, unfortunately a bit globally. But we are also, I mean, as, as, uh, as I think as, as activists, we, it's, it helps when we can share our stories and then we can also um, learn from each other. And so this is a bit also the objective of this, uh, this session, that we, uh, we can really share uh, our experiences and uh, hopefully that we can inspire, I mean, among, I mean, we can inspire each other, but also, uh, of course, the pe people that uh, will watch uh, and, and join this, uh, this session. Um, so we have um, a number of speakers. I mean, really a very impressive list of uh, speakers, uh, uh, um, we can say. So uh, we are very uh, thankful that all these people can make time uh, to join us. Uh, uh, and uh, um, this, in this uh, webinar, we will really focus on uh, the right to dissent, which is really at the heart of our democracy. Uh, um, we, we, uh, we see that defenders of human rights uh, who break the silence to protect uh, the climate, environment, stand to defend land rights, lead protests or for labor and women's rights, uh, for social justice, are on the front lines every day. Um, they feel the route of corporations, uh, state apparatus, uh, private militia threats and public attacks. Uh, they're facing uh, incarceration, legal cases, physical attacks and harm to their families. These right defenders and their families often have to face this alone as civil society as institutional mechanism have increasingly been hollowed out nationally and globally. So in this context that uh, APF, uh, Asia European Peoples Forum with the Parliamentarians Network, along with the ASEAN Parliamentarians for Human Rights are organizing this webinar in a series on the right to dissent. Um, so the webinar aims to build coalitions of support for rights defenders, including environmental, women, uh, labor, land, and human rights defenders. Um, as we have a, a long list of speakers and very interesting speakers, um, I think the, the role of the moderators is to remain a bit in the back and uh, uh, let's say make sure that we uh, do some time management, that everybody has as, uh, say um, um, is coming uh, on, uh, on on speaking terms, and that we have also um, a good flow of uh, the say the, the discussion in between. Um, we would like to start with uh, say uh, two speakers who will give a bit, let's say, some more trends uh, on uh, painting some context of uh, people experiences uh, um, on uh, human rights uh, threats um, from Asia and Europe. Huh? And I would like to invite uh, the first speaker, Arti Narsi. Um, Eva, can you introduce her? Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Chris. Um, Arti is a feminist and civic space researcher on Europe, Central Asia, and the MENA at Civicus. Uh, Civicus is a global alliance dedicated to strengthening citizen action and civil society around the world. Uh, for those who don't know Civicus, I do recommend you to take a look at their uh, monitor that provides some very interesting data on, uh, on civic space. Arti, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Eva and Chris. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen. And thank you for the opportunity to, sorry, I'm unable to share my screen for some reason. 
Not sure why. There we go. Okay. Sorry, tech problems. Oh, can everyone see my screen? I can see. I can see. Okay. So I'd like to um, maybe just kick off by um, starting off with a quick round of what the Civicus Monitor does. Um, we are an online platform which tracks and rates civic space in 197 countries and territories around the world. And part of what we do is work in collaboration with over 20 research partners around the globe to monitor civic space. That is specifically the right to peaceful assembly, freedom of expression and um, freedom of association. So as I said, we track and we monitor and we rate civic space and we rate countries according to a five point rating system uh, based on the following ratings, open being the most open for civil society, followed by narrowed, and then obstructed, uh, repressed, and closed being the worst rating that a country could possibly have in terms of civic freedoms. And as you can see on the screen there um, is a breakdown of the ratings for the European region. Uh, we have 15 countries that are rated as open, 20 that are rated as narrowed, five as obstructed, two as repressed, and two as closed. And I think what's interesting to point out here is that over the years, we are seeing that a number of countries are making their way from the open to narrowed region, which shows that there is a, um, this ongoing regression of civic freedoms um, in the continent. But this is also a trend that we're seeing globally that year on year civic freedoms are in decline. Added to this, what we're also seeing in the European region is that even established democracies are, um, are having their civic freedoms threatened in fundamental ways, for example, in countries like the UK and France. And of course, the COVID-19 pandemic has been added to this, um, and we are seeing that governments in Europe and around the world are using the pandemic as a pretext to limit fundamental freedoms. So I'm going to be taking you through some of the trends from our report, People Power Under Attack. And as I said, we uh, monitor ratings. And last year, we downgraded the ratings of four countries in the European region, that being Belgium, Czech Republic, uh, Belarus, and Poland. And interesting to note that three of these countries are EU member states. For example, Belarus, we downgraded the rating to close as a result of the systematic silencing of civil society that we've documented. Um, following the uh, protests um, that emerged before and after the disputed August 2020 election results. And similarly, in Poland, we're seeing uh, the rating changing from narrow to obstructed. And I'll touch on Poland a bit more later as a case study in my presentation. So the top five trends we are seeing um, in Europe are, are they on the screen. You can see protesters being detained being number one. And I think in relation to this webinar, particularly important is the use of intimidation and harassment. So we are seeing protesters being detained in a number of countries. Uh, for example, in the UK, protesters, um, protest stage for environmental rights and climate justice. Um, as well as protests staged against the restrictive policing bill have been met with excessive force and detentions. But we're also seeing this trend in countries that are rated as open, for example, in Finland, where climate protesters are facing um, significant repressions um, when staging their actions. Intimidation and harassment has been um, a common tactic being used um, in the region where we are even seeing that senior politicians from prime ministers to presidents are partaking in this intimidation and harassment. Uh, for example, in Slovenia, civil society has been continuously publicly vilified by uh, President Janša. In Serbia, we're seeing that um, investigative portal, um, Krik, has been publicly smeared by the Serbian Progressive Party, the president, as well as pro-government media outlets who have branded the organization a criminal group. 
Additionally, we're seeing that a number of states are passing restrictive laws. This is either used to obstruct the work of civil society or um, um, limit the rights of excluded groups. For example, in Hungary, we're seeing that um, there have been several pieces of legislation being passed limiting um, LGBTI rights. We're also seeing that in countries like France, a number of restrictive laws have been passed, such as the, um, the law on anti-separatism, which specifically targets CSOs um, in terms of their funding opportunities um, if they do not comply with the principles of the French Republic. And then another trend we are seeing is attacks on journalists. And um, this is particularly interesting in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, as we're seeing that a number of countries have had protests against COVID-19 measures, and many journalists around the world, for example, um, particularly in Netherlands and Germany, have come under attack during these protests, where they, they've been branded as lying um, about the pandemic and um, they face significant amount of threats during these protests. So, so as um, mentioned before, Poland was um, one of the countries, one of the four countries downgraded in the region from narrow to obstructed. And I think it provides a particularly interesting case study in terms of threats to human rights defenders, particularly women human rights defenders and LGBTQI plus defenders. So, in uh, conjunction with the erosion of the rule of law, as well as judicial independence, we are seeing that the government has continuously targeted women's rights activists, um, particularly in the context of um, reproductive justice, where the Constitutional Court in October 2020 ruled um, to impose a de facto abortion ban. And this resulted in mass protests with um, women's rights organization um, really um, being at the forefront. They have faced intimidation, they faced harassment, they faced bomb threats, death threats, as well as rape threats, with very little police interaction uh, or investigation on the perpetrators making these threats. In addition, we're seeing that LGBTQI plus defenders are being targeted through the use of the penal code and protesters, a protest stage for LGBTI rights have also been targeted through the use of excessive force. Um, in addition to um, the threats that defenders are facing, we're seeing that media independence has been significantly targeted with independent media outlets facing strategic litigation. And we are also seeing restriction on rights in the context of the migrant crisis at the Poland and Belarus border. So these are some of the reasons that have led to um, Poland being downgraded. And just to, I think, touch on again, you know, the threats that women human rights defenders are facing. Um, we've been working with the Polish women's strike since the beginning of protests to support them um, and to, um, you know, work on advocacy at the international level. And I think this quote by Marta Lempar from the Polish Women's Strike really captures the resilience of uh, defenders in the region. So she says, this is a full blown war on women in Poland. We say what, not one more and we resist, but we need help here as we stand our ground. And I think this you know, highlights the importance of you know, thinking about how can we um, as civil society and international organizations protect human rights defenders, um, you know, what resources can be allocated to them and additional support, um, because as much as I have uh, presented in relation to restrictions in the region, we are seeing there's the immense amount of civil society resilience and resilience um, being shown by defenders. Um, but in the long term, these defenders do need to support and um, resources to continue and sustain their fights. I'm going to um, pause there for now, and my details are on the slide, and I will also post some resources in the chat for you. Um, please feel free to ask any questions as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Arti. Uh, very interesting detail, and indeed, uh, um, I mean, the eyes are mainly on, uh, say, on the global south when we talk about, uh, say, human rights uh, violations and, and shrinking of uh, the civic space, but we also, of course, see here in Europe that there are uh, very worrying trends um, uh, for journalists, uh, for uh, investigative journalists, for 
human rights defenders for say uh, lgbtq uh, say rights uh, defenders so indeed uh, um, and yeah you you didn't mention of course uh, and and just the the, the newest uh, say what has happened here in europe and is the and the, the war in ukraine where also uh, i mean atrocities are happening uh, all over and yeah it's it's very hard indeed to to see uh, also now with the media what is what is fake and what is uh, and what is happening in the on the ground huh? but uh what we get uh, also from I mean, from reliable sources and i think you will have i doubt you will have more work to uh, to monitor this as well eh? and on unity say on european uh, ground uh, a new wave of, uh, say, uh, yeah, also migrants uh, and refugees coming over. That's uh, a big, big, uh, say, uh, challenge for uh, European countries to deal with this. Um, but we will come back to this uh, later. Um, I would like to invite Karen. Uh, um, Karen um, is um, uh, currently the commissioner eh, on the Commission of Human Rights in the Philippines. She has been serving already for uh, 25 years um, on several, say, positions uh, within uh, the CHR. Um, and in fact, she also played a, a vital role in the Commission's engagement with the UN Human Rights Council and uh, treaty uh, bodies. Um, Karen, um, I guess you have about seven, eight minutes uh, to make uh, your case. Um, is that fine for you? Yes, yes, that's fine. And just tell me if I go over. Um, I yeah, don't yeah. have a presentation, but uh, uh, just, just to give thanks, of course, to the Asia Europe People's Forum and, of course, ASEAN uh, Parliamentarians for Human Rights for this opportunity to be with you today. Um, uh, what I will uh, talk to you about is really how a national human rights institution can help in the protection of human rights defenders. And I'll give one uh, example of that. But just to say that the national human rights institutions uh, is perhaps a natural ally of human rights defenders because we are human rights defenders as well. Um, we can be a venue for refuge or sanctuary, um, and, but we are an independent monitor um, independent from government and also civil society. I often say that, um, you know, when I uh, encounter audiences from both government and civil society, I say we're like, um, uh, we're in between a rock and a hard place. Um, and I always ask civil society, you choose what you want. I don't think you're a rock. I think you're in a hard place, but I think you're in a harder place now, especially in the Philippines where we know that there is shrinking civic space. We are grateful that the Philippines, largely the civil society um, organizations in the Philippines still have confidence in the Commission on Human Rights and have gone to us for help in um, uh, defending human rights defenders. So allow me to just showcase public inquiries as a uh, as one of the methods by which we can also protect and promote uh, the rights of uh, human rights defenders. So we were able to do a, an inquiry, a public inquiry on the situation, human rights situation of human rights defenders based on a letter that was sent to us largely by Karapatan, uh, who asked us to take a look at um, uh, the phenomenon of red tagging, but we decided to take a look at the situation of the human rights situation. And I'll just share with you some of the findings. No? The main finding is really that human rights defenders are greatly at risk due to inimical acts, practices, and omissions that threaten their life, liberty, and security. In our inquiry, which actually was concluded, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, in 2019, the commission found that there is systemic attack, systematic attack against human rights uh, defenders across all sectors of civil society. And uh, this revealed the following violations and abuses. Of course, it starts with the distortion of the concept of human rights. So in that way, 
the work of human rights defenders are actually undermining even the Commission on Human Rights. Um, uh, when it is twisted to fit the narrative that HRDs are protectors of criminals, for instance, instead of decrying human rights violations allegedly perpetrated against state security forces and victims of crimes and only choose to advocate for criminals. There's also public vilification. We've heard um, uh, from our friend from Civicus, um, but that includes, of course, profanity-laden tirades by no less than the highest authority in the Philippines. Um, and prominent examples of this include, for instance, Sister Patricia Fox, who is a longtime resident of the Philippines, actively campaigning for the rights of impoverished farmers in Mindanao, um, whom the government arrested and deported. Maria Reza, we have heard that earlier when we had um, a side conversation about it uh, before this webinar as well. Red tagging, of course, to make it easy for military and paramilitary units to silence or cause untold human rights and abuses on vocal dissenters, government agents usually resort, resort to stereotyping and caricaturing individuals. Um, the, the accusations of being fronts of uh, the Communist um, uh, Party of the Philippines, National People's Army, and National Democratic Front took various forms from speeches of the president himself, declar declarations of high ranking government officials, videos, PowerPoint presentations shown to schools, local communities, posters in barangay halls. Um, uh, press releases by state media, posts in official social media accounts of different divisions of the security sector and others. No? Um, there's also, <clears throat> I'm sorry, <coughs> there's also profiling and surveillance. And once a progressive organization is red tag, that usually follows what usually follows is profiling and surveilling of its members. And um, uh, in one particular case, the Alliance of uh, Concerned Teachers actually complained um, uh, to, uh, for a petition. They did file a petition for prohibition for the issuance of a temporary restraining order to enjoin the Philippine National Police from continuing its profiling and surveillance activities. But then, <clears throat> this was um, uh, dismissed due to technicalities, including um, the fact that there was failure to state specific dates when the copies of this uh, uh, police memoranda were received by uh, the members of this uh, union of teachers. Militarization of government, the commission, of course, in its report, uh, reiterated that while there is no prohibition on appointments of former military officers to civilian positions, it may, um, it actually, um, uh, you know, may further ostracize HRDs and impede their work. And then, of course, you have weaponization of the law. We've heard this before. And um, uh, <clears throat> many HRDs suffer under false criminal charges. And we have found that in our particular case. No? Uh, there is also um, uh, issuances of regulations, such as the one from the Securities and Exchange Commission that actually obliges nonprofit organizations to disclose details, such as full list of donors, intended beneficiaries, location of beneficiaries, projects, area of operations, among others, and the failure to comply we can mean revocation of the registration. Of course, we have the Anti-Terror Act um, uh, and uh, the unbridled power to determine who are suspected uh, terrorists by designation is something that poses a threat to um, uh, human rights offenders. I'm going to stop uh, in this uh, one other um, observation that we have is really the general shrinking civic space. And I'd like to end by quoting our um, chairperson who passed away, uh, Chito Gascon, who is known to all of you. He remarked during the inquiry that often when the space is shrinking at the national level, many HRDs seek out platforms at the international level. 
But then, of course, as we know, um, the crackdown against HRDs in the Philippines have actually extended to the international plane. And um, uh, I'm going to end there. Those are the observations. Of course, we have recommendations. I can post the link of the report of the inquiry for your, um, uh, for your information, further information. But just to say that um, thank you for this forum. It is indeed very important because we need to strategize um, on how to better protect human rights defenders. Uh, maraming salamat. Thank you, Carol. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, and it's, uh, this uh, not uh, not so nice picture, bleak picture in that uh, of the human rights uh, situation in the Philippines. But uh, uh, that does not, of course, not only refers to to the Philippines, but uh, this is indeed a, a global trend that we are observing and that we have to deal with as uh, as uh, rights defenders. So, um, so after these uh, two introductions, um, I would uh, like to invite uh, Kavita, uh, Kavita Srivastava um, from India. Um, she's a human rights activist working to protect uh, people's democratic and constitutional rights. And she's been long time in the, say, a long time experience. She's a member of uh, PUCL, the Public People's Union for Civil uh, Liberties a platform for the defense of civil liberties and human rights. Um, Kavita, you have Am I audible? Um, can I be heard? We can hear you, yes. And is there no video of mine? I mean, I'm sorry. The settings are such that I cannot even, I, I don't know how to switch on my video. I mean, I, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I don't know whether I'm at all in the no problem, panel Kavita. section of the webinar. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm sorry. Uh, I, can, um, I, I don't know no where problem. to switch my video on. That's what I was asking. You can so, start, Kapita. No problem. Yeah, sorry. It? Yeah. yeah. So friends, uh, India is going through a very, very difficult time and our rating is continuously slipping as far as a democracy is concerned. Uh, we've again slipped several notches and um, it's, it's, you know, like full blast repression of journalists, of activists, and all those who dissent uh, from the narrative who disagree with the present dispensation uh, India now, for the last uh, seven years, has had a full-fledged um, right-wing government. Uh, the ruling party, the Bharatiya Janata Party, is the political platform of a hundred, almost hundred-year-old uh, right-wing fascist organization, Hindu right-wing fascist organization, called the. Uh, Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, the RSS. And uh, they are very clear that they want to make a Hindu Rashtra. Uh, they want to make a theocratic state with the Hindu religion being the dominant religion and all the other religions being subservient. For them, the three enemies written by the ideologue uh, uh, Golwalkar were the communists, the Christians, and the Muslims. So presently, we are seeing the targeting of all three. But what is what uh, the what the present time shows most is a, a full all-round attack on Muslims, and um, I mean, literally, they have become. Um, subordinated citizens. They're not equal to the Hindus, the, the majoritarian community. They're not equal. They're lesser than Christians also. They're in fact lesser than within the whole Hindu fold. You have the quote unquote, the untouchables, the scheduled caste and uh, the really, really um, uh, you know, older indigenous people, the Adivasis. Muslims today are even, have been pushed even lower than, than ordinary Dalits and 
Adivasis in terms of their dignity and open, openly uh, the call for genocide uh, is being given from these so-called uh, religious parliaments. And what we see, what, what is the tragedy is the complete uh, breakdown of um, you know, the criminal justice system to take them to task. So why Indian democracy is withering is because the institutions that which should have uh, countered this kind of an attack of a section of society sponsored by the executive has also caved in. The police would hardly make a case if such a genocide call is made. Instead, all those who would challenge the call, and if they are Muslims or activists, counter cases would be made against them. Actually, they would be the people who would be first booked. Uh, secondly, uh, what we are increasingly seeing that the judiciary is also caving in. I mean, I, we've, it was only, uh, I mean, in the kind of situation we are where activists are being thrown in uh, completely. Um, into um, jails for questioning the government. And there are these two instances. One is the famous Bhima Koregao case where, the, where about 16 top activists, intellectual, uh, cultural expressionists, uh, ideologues were thrown in into jail since 2018, the number 16, it's called the famous Bhima Koregao 16. And they were all taken in because they wanted to create a chaos-like situation in India and even uh, pull, bring down the government. And the tools that the government used, when they threw in these activists, the kind of surveillance you can see, they were surveilled uh, by Pegasus. Uh, that's that's come out clean now that all the telephones had uh, the uh, you know Pegasus had been penetrated and netwire which was planted in their computers to create all kinds of files and with these uh, fabricated cases where chart sheets run into 15,000 20,000 pages where they're booked under the terror law uh, called the UAPA. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, people never, are never, never granted bail. It's actually a case where the, the trial will never start. All those who were booked in 2018 and arrested till date, I have not seen any trial underway. They will never be granted bail. So it's just, throwing in people and keeping them inside, that is what the uh, UAPA has become, the terror law has become. Similarly, uh, we find that, so one is the targeting of activists, the other is the targeting of uh, young student leaders. And that's frightening, because in Delhi, uh, when, uh, the, when India passed, the most atrocious anti-constitution in the parliament passed, the anti-constitutional law of citizenship, um, subordinating literally uh, being Muslim. I don't have the time to explain all. So a large number of Muslim women came out to protest huge gatherings of Muslim women. And uh, that, that of course ended up in one city in Delhi in a situation of violence where Muslims were killed in large numbers. So instead of uh, putting behind bars uh, the right-wing Hindutva activists who provoked the violence, who gave hate speeches, instead we have young students who have been thrown in under the UAP, under the terror law. And again, each one of them has been triangle. This is since 2020. They've been thrown into um, jail. And now what we're seeing, I mean, Kashmir, uh, again, since uh, 2019, um, August, when the special status of Article 370 was withdrawn. Today, um, if you see the situation in uh, uh, Kashmir, I mean, apart from withdrawing state status, uh, withdrawing status of citizens, Abhika, getting their right to vote. You have uh, one more minute. 
yeah, uh, what we find today is that the journalists, uh, many journalists find themselves behind bars. And most importantly, what is very worrying is that very clearly they've been told that either you state a narrative or else you go behind bars. So young independent journalists are booked in case after case under the Public Security Act of British Times or the, under the Colonial Times or under the UAPA. It is a very, I just conclude by saying that India is within South Asia, which gave hope for democracy in the South Asian region for about, you know, till about a decade ago ha, is now sunk probably as uh, you know to become one of the worst states in the country and what we fear like just what you, uh, Russia did to Ukraine to you know just finish off a country I, India could well do it to its neighbors we just saw recently that missile just took off accidentally. It cannot penetrate into Pakistan territory for more than 120 kilometers. What I'm trying to say is that anything and everything will be done apart from bringing elections, etc., and poisoning the mindset of majoritarian people to build a consensus apart from that. We are sitting on short fuse. We can also have a war to simply keep a certain dispensation going and to make uh, a Hindu Rashtra, to make a theocratic state out of secular India. So actually, not just, I mean, we are a subcontinent, the, the, the 136 billion people that we are not only need to fear, but our neighbors, we are a very big threat to the South Asian region. It's, it's not about civil war in one or two of these countries that's happening, but uh, we are a larger threat, not state is making war against its own people and its neighbors and therefore our country is a threat and we are threatened uh, thank you so much thank you so much Carita, for this uh, very interesting insight on um, in the troubling situation for civil society actors in, in India um, for the suppression of, of Muslims and, uh, and, and how colonial law is still being uh, misused uh, for, these, uh, for these actors uh, these days. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is uh, Harris Azar. Um, Harris Azar is an Indonesian human rights advocate. He is one of the co-founders of uh, Lokatarum Foundation, which is a, uh, a law and human rights organization for its strategic litigation, research, and uh, consultancy. Uh, he's also founder of Akasasi.id, um, a platform uh, on human rights digital-based research. Uh, Harris, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Eva, and also, here is a good afternoon for uh, uh, all of you and good morning probably with uh, friends in the north. Um, uh, it's happy, uh, always happy for me to come back to this uh, forum. I joined uh, two forums before when it was in Brussels, uh, not in, in Belgium. Uh, it's very a live forum. Uh, so since the time is very limited, uh, I'm trying to come up with uh, some points only, referring to my knowledge and my experience, uh, looking at my, my organizations and also what happened as a lawyer to, when I defend uh, some, uh, some communities or victims, and also the case that uh, coming to me at the end, uh, which is very uh, interesting. My organization, Lokataru, is dedicated to work on the shrinking civic space since the uh, early time of the, when this organization was established, like five years ago. So we did a lot of uh, monitoring research and also advocacy on how the, the attack to the NGOs or to the CSOs uh, or the, to the, some uh, decent uh, groups. Uh, we also 
have uh, key findings where that uh, thing is growing uh, very bad. Uh, and this is meet to the political situations getting heat up because the next two years will be the elections. First of all, let me describe a very brief on uh, how and why uh, attack to the NGOs and CSOs or to the local groups uh, keep going and uh, growing. Uh, because uh, the current government and also the, the, the business, uh, the, the big business groups in Indonesia are uh, very dominated by the political and business sectors. In some situations, in some settings, in some policies, the business groups are sitting in the political uh, fora or the political groups are uh, consist or uh, consist of uh, those who have the, the business uh, entities or they are linked, uh, they appropriate quote unquote uh, in many ways. And which is just, it's happening everywhere uh, since long time ago. But, but uh, in Indonesia, why I have to emphasize these classical issues because they become so open. Uh, they become so open, they become so active uh, to link up between the political groups, uh, those who are in the government with, uh, with those who are in the business groups. Half of the cabinets of the current administration, they are uh, coming from the business groups. So uh, like in the COVID-19 policies, uh, we uh, it's been published and everybody knows here, those who got the incomes from selling the PCR uh, are, the, are the corporations that owned by the ministers uh, in the country. So this is the situation. The other big issues is the mining uh, and also the natural resources uh, in touch with uh, the business that the business uh, the business activities that uh, really count to the natural resources on how to utilize the natural resources uh, in the extractive way uh, and also the larger uh, larger business also they try to put uh, the millions of people the young people. In, uh, into the cheap labor policies. There's no protections. Uh, so these are the things that quite, uh, that quite happening. It's also because it's like a cake. So uh, the government, the way they try to be exist and to, be, to secure their position is try to, to, to bargain with the different groups, different groups and different. So they, they give some business policies, business opportunities, business policies, which back up by the government. So that's why the size of a country will be occupied by so many groups, the economic, uh, the, business, the business and the industries opportunity occupied by those uh, business groups. So this background, I would like to uh, put as the first thesis to say that that's why at the end, the locals, the ordinary peoples, they are being threatened by these policies. They've been pushed to the side because of, uh, because of, uh, because of this greedy business policies. And then uh, in some big islands, this is Indonesia is an archipelago countries like, uh, like, uh, like Philippines also. Uh, like if you see Sumatra, it's already almost occupied one to the others. Now, I would like to make a simple statement that now uh, the intensity of using the natural resources as a basis to generate business, they're moving shapely to Papua, the West Papua. So that's why in West Papua, uh, wood uh, forestry is, is amazing. Uh, gold mining is uh, one of the best uh, spot in the world uh, with high quality. Uh, and also the fisheries. And so, so that's why the security businesses is very, uh, very tempting on how to give the protections 
to that kind of uh, business activities. So this kind of very brief and imperfect uh, uh, description that I'm trying to say here creates so many complaints, uh, uh, the fight backs from the locals. Uh, the way they fight back is by using the social media, uh, exercise the, the protests on the street, and also uh, file a case. But we have fight backs also from the, from the business group and also from the politicians or from the people from the government. Uh, the list that we have here is uh, first, they exercise the, the legal setting, they say. And they always said that this is a democratic country. They always say. But that is, uh, yes, this is a democratic country. Uh, they said that's why we have to use the law, the law mechanism. But we know how, how the disparities if the, uh, the silky tie lawyers that used by the company go to the court, they have a full access. While the locals, they have a different abilities, capabilities on how to access the legal mechanism. So that's why it's, uh, uh, there is a discrimination on how to uh, access the, the justice. I so- have, uh, uh, One more minute. Okay. So the judicial harassment is also uh, it's a, it's a, it's a one thing. The other thing is like they use the social media. Social media is very uh, quite something. I'm not saying powerful, but it's quite something because the social media being used by the government on how to maintain the popularity, right? to, to maintain the popularity. But the government, the way they attack the or to build the discourse or to intervene is not by direct action from them. They have like the, they have like the, we call it here is a buzzer. Buzzer is like those who are pro-government languages or pro-government discourse on how to attack the civil society voice or the ordinary people. The other one is like to intervene the administrations of the NGOs or the organizations. Uh, uh, also the donor organization who are coming here, they have to present, make a presentation to the government uh, uh, what to do, uh, how to do, and how long it that will be takes, and who are your grantees, something like that. And it has to be in line with the national project uh, or national program, which the way that national program is exercised is only belongs to the to the regime, not belongs to the voice of the decent or voice of the locals. So these are the things that quite uh, very brief, I'm trying to develop uh, the picture of in, 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 in Indonesia. And then uh, the next two years, we will have like the elections, the national elections. People are hoping at least uh, many victims, locals or the, the, those uh, communities who are who got the bad impact from the, uh, the current government. We are looking at the moment on how uh, the, the new regime will able to develop the, uh, the better approach uh, to remedy the situations. Uh, so this is a big challenge for the NGOs and also the CSOs. Uh, I, I am very welcome to, to take a lesson from the other friends here. I'll stop there, I'll, I'll give it back to you, Eva. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Harris. Um, yeah, indeed, I mean, as you mentioned, I, I know it really, it really uh, donor NGOs who really have problems um, to, to really continue their, their work in Indonesia eh? because they, they have to make this MOU with the, in the yeah. Indonesian government. Eh? Yeah, yeah. That's also one of the reasons why uh, we as Triple Eleven, we don't uh, open an office in Indonesia because if you yeah. don't open an office, you, you kind of stay a bit under the radar. Uh, yeah. yeah. But I hope, you know, I hope no you know, government you know, official is watching now. Yeah. Chris is <laughs> I also uh, very know about how the donor agencies in Indonesia being uh, struck down uh, slowly by slowly, little by little. Uh, so I think it's 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 a good one that uh, Triple Eleven it's uh, keep the distance to present in Indonesia. Yeah. You find your way. That is good. Indeed, indeed. 
Okay, thanks, Harith. Um, uh, we shall quickly move to the next speaker. In the, so from Indonesia, we go to Philippines, um, to uh, Mai uh, uh, Takeban. Uh, she's the director of uh, LRC, the Legal Rights and Natural Resources Center or Friends of the Earth uh, Philippines. Um, she's also a co-convener of the Panagisa uh, Philippine Network to uphold indigenous people's rights and also a uh, chairperson of the Alternative Law Group. Um, my, you have the floor, and I understood that you will uh, so show some slides, but uh, you have difficulties uh, putting on your camera. Thank you, Chris. Yes, um, I have limited internet connection. There's a strong rain outside right now. I'd rather prioritize sharing the photographs just so the words come alive. Um, some of the things I will speak about, Karen has already uh, shared earlier, but I will speak with more particularity um, with us about the sector that we at LRC work with, which is indigenous peoples uh, and their right to land and natural resources. And in the work we do, we do see the very alarming global trend of rising attacks against land and environmental defenders. Many of the environmental human rights defenders in the Philippines are indigenous leaders um, who are at the forefront of their community's defense against the encroachment of so-called development projects you know, as elsewhere in Asia and the world. Um, like elsewhere, uh, these projects are primarily extractivist, uh, mining, agro-industrial plantations, to dams. Um, the Philippines has, in fact, consistently ranked as the most dangerous country to be an environmental defender in Asia. Here, uh, environmental defenders are harassed, surveilled, or killed. Five years ago, in fact, one of our community partners, uh, eight community leaders, including their esteemed elder, were killed in a military encounter. Um, they were resisting the operation of an industrial coffee plantation. The Indigenous Peoples Rights Act or IPRA, which was and is intended to protect and promote indigenous people's rights is a landmark legislation. One of the first in the world. It predates UNJIP by a decade. It is in fact a translation of the Philippine constitution's mandate to protect and uh, respect indigenous people's rights. It's the same constitution um, that articulates the right of the Filipino people to a balanced and healthful ecology. We've uh, banked on IPRA to assert indigenous people's right to self-determination, uh, their right to say no to projects that desecrate their sacred grounds and destroy the environment. Um, but many a times they have been locked out of the process. So their consent very often demoted to mere consultation. Um, it is an uphill battle to realize the laws and tensions and aspirations. In the beginning, we've had to assert its very constitutionality. The law was challenged in the Supreme Court for being unlawful in that it was depriving the state of its ownership over public lands of minerals and other natural resources. Ultimately, it was a divided court you know, that upheld IPRA's constitutionality. Very slim, you know, seven yes, seven no. And so it is that kind of almost half-hearted framing and conviction that characterizes judicial appreciation of indigenous people's rights in the Philippines. Um, moreover, competing with a national framework of development, one that favors investment and resources exploitation creates a condition that perpetuates the community's marginalization. Um, many of the natural resources issues in the Philippines have indigenous peoples as protagonists, not defenders of our last bastions of forests and biodiversity. So that um, whether this be based on IPRA or on another law, the court's appreciation and defense of indigenous people's rights have been slow, if not, and availing. Um, more recently, the Philippine Congress passed the anti-terrorism law. This was certified by President Duterte as urgent. 
its overbroad and vague provisions left us with very little choice but to file a case with the Supreme Court for certiorari you know, to declare its unconstitutionality you know, for violating fundamental freedoms guaranteed under the Philippine Constitution. Um, the law petrifies the country in a state of emergency, really, normalizing what would otherwise be you know, reserved judicial force. Now, it paves the way for democratic processes to give way to the expansion of, of the state's police power. You know? We represented indigenous peoples, uh, defenders and advocates in the petition. You know? Their particular condition make them prime targets of the law. Many of them, in fact, have been tagged as insurgents, terrorists, for having disagreed, protested, dissented against state-supported, if not um, sponsored projects. Uh, these projects couched as integral to, to the nation's economic growth often have the military as a part of its uh, security support. It is not surprising, you know, uh, that many of the defenders killed were alleged to have perished in military encounters. The very reality of the law, whether actually referred to or not, serves to legitimize state action against dissenters. Um, a little before Christmas last year, the Supreme Court decided that the anti-terrorism law is constitutional. It struck down two provisions, particularly one, a qualifier, for being overbroad and violative of freedom of expression, but majority of the law's provisions, including uh, the freeze order on assets, arrests without the benefit of probable cause, or even judicially issued warrant, um, the prolonged imprisonment and broad sweeping definition for crimes of terrorism are already and remain in effect. Um, it is a legacy of autocracy. Uh, clothed with the veneer of a representative government. So, uh, recently, just February, one of our petitioners, Chad, a young volunteer teacher in an indigenous school, uh, suffered multiple gunshot wounds and died along with another volunteer teacher and three of their companions. Chad was 26. Again, the military reported them killed in a military encounter that Chad's group engaged in firefight. You know? An independent autopsy report uh, suggests otherwise. Chad had long been branded by the military as being a communist rebel, uh, a terrorist you know, for, for teaching math and science to children and young people in the communities and you know, for supporting their cause quite ardently, how, however way he could. So along with other groups, we filed a motion for reconsideration and we're awaiting the court's final ruling. Um, I guess I will sum up uh, the present constitution of the Philippines, you know, like many other constitutions was hard fought. It took a revolution to topple down a fascist corrupt regime, the Marcos kleptocracy, to be able to have it. But the legal is imbibed with the political, our laws are largely dependent on the powers that be in Congress, and these are conditioned by its dominant interests and agenda. Uh, the Philippines will soon have its uh, national elections this coming May. And well, another Marcos, well, not much different from the one deposed is running. And it seems like we are haunted by our past. And so it is with foreboding and hope, but uh, more hope, mostly hope that we continue with the struggle. So I end there and uh, thank you for your time. One more minute, Mike. One more minute. Okay, yeah. okay, oh, okay. I'm, okay. I'm just okay. Finished. Great, super. Thank you. That's fine. Great, great, great. Yeah, thanks a lot for this contribution, uh, Mai. And uh, from Mai, we go to May. Uh, May Ocampo um, is uh, currently the executive director of, uh, of Protection International. She's a feminist human rights defender who, who began her career and activism in the Philippines from a young age. Uh, she has uh, over 20 years experience in leadership positions in international NGOs based in Southeast Asia and Europe. So she's perfect, uh, say, a uh, guest at our AEPF uh, session. You have the floor, May. Great, thanks, Chris. 
Uh, I hope I can live up to that perfectness. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you. Thank you to Triple Eleven, to the APF. It's been a while since I joined some of the, the events of APF, and it's a pleasure to, to be here amongst uh, like-minded friends. I see a lot of you who I've been working with for many years and yeah, and been partners with for yeah, decades in fact. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to shift a little bit, shift a little bit in terms of just uh, presenting to you who we are as Protection International, uh, uh, as part of um, how do we defend the, defend the defenders. Um, next slide, please. Tabby. And by the way, thank you. Thank you, special mention to Tabby for actually doing this for me because I have uh, challenges in terms of technology when it, whenever I share my screen. Um, who is Protection International? We are a nonprofit uh, organization that supports human rights defenders. Um, and we, are, we develop security and protection management strategies across the world, specifically in regional hubs. We have regional hubs in Africa, in Mesoamerica, and this year, we intend to launch our Southeast Asia regional hub and in the coming year in Eurasia. We've been working with local partners since 2004. And currently, we've been expanding and growing. And as you can, uh, as you can imagine, you know, there's, a, there's quite a demand in terms of human rights uh, defenders protection and how we can assist human rights defenders around the world in looking at ways on how to protect their rights as, as human rights defenders, as the, as the topic says, right? The, you, we have human rights um, activists who are defending other human rights activists around the world from individuals and communities. And our role really in terms of expanding and, and supporting uh, the movement is really to build offices around the world and see how we can support the development of capacities of communities and individuals. Uh, we have country offices in Indonesia, in Thailand, in DRC, in Kenya, Tanzania, Colombia, Brazil, Guatemala, Honduras. And of course, we, our global team uh, currently is in Brussels, and it's a fantastic team of mixed uh, individuals. Uh, we're very intersectional, and uh, quite a lot of us are human rights defenders ourselves who have been part of the movement as well for many years. Next slide, please. Um, what do we do exactly uh, as we support individuals and organizations and networks? One of our main, um, as you say, uh, if you may, DNA is in terms of defining and putting in practice protection tactics and setting up protection desks in countries and regions where defenders are at a particular risk, risks. We also assist in building capacities of individual, individual defenders organizations, networks, and communities to analyze the risks around them and improve their security. It's exactly what uh, um, some of you have articulated, right? Uh, many instances in communities or in, 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 in cities or your, in your own contexts that all of uh, most of the activists who are fighting against, let's say a corporation or, or an invasion of a company into their lands, Often it really is about protecting their lands without thinking about their safety or without thinking about of their protection. And part of our, our, our niche is really to assist individual defenders in building their capacities in terms of looking at their risks around them and how to improve their security. We have also, we're also quite good in terms of researching good protection practices and challenges. And we've done, we have a lot of manuals, reports, and, and tools that we can offer to partners around the world. And later on, uh, towards the end of the slide, I will show you some of the, the work that we have around, uh, around uh, manuals, protection manuals and tools. We've been as well advocating for nation states to protect human rights defenders through, through the recognition and compliance with international instruments and passing of public policy policies. I think this is one of the most crucial points, I think in terms of defending uh, human rights defenders is the presence um, or not the not, not presence, but the, the loss that we have in countries and not just the loss that we have in countries in protecting human rights defenders, but also the compliance on, to this loss. We can have loss and policies around the world or in, in countries, but if there's no compliance and no policy synergy, 
then we defeat the purpose of having laws around them that protect human rights defenders. Um, we are also, uh, one of our, our, our areas as well that we are doing at the moment in terms of public policy, we are uh, around the world, especially in uh, Latin America right now, Mesoamerica, and uh, we participate in the definition and the review of protection systems. Uh, currently, we have a project in, uh, we're, we're entering into a project in, in Mexico, uh, specifically in terms of assisting them to draft a policy to protect human rights defenders. And this is one of the exciting things that we are heading into in the coming months. Uh, next slide, please. What is our approach to protection to the protection of human rights defenders? There are, there are four key areas that um, we, we do. Specifically as well, I'd like to highlight that we have a psychosocial approach. So apart from um, our, our key, um, key approach of uh, the right to defend human rights defenders, where we, prom we promote a rights-based approach. We do collective protection. We promote collective, collective strategies to strengthen the group. And we also promote the strengthening of internal and external solidarity networks among HRD groups. And I'd like to highlight perhaps at this point that one of the key um, successes I would say um, that, that we have in Protection International right now is our psychosocial approach. We just released a manual, which I can share with you later the link, um, mainly because we understand that care and protection, care and protection are indivisible, uh, which means that protection strategies would, should address the individual and collective emotional impacts of the HRDs. Um, this is one of the areas where we've been investing our time and effort for the past um, five years or so. And uh, I, can say, I, I can talk to you more about it later when I share, you, share with you the resources. Uh, next slide, please. As we all know, <laughs> I was thinking about this slide and I was thinking, oh, yes, of course, all of you, especially the, the ones who are studying, who are lawyers in, in this uh, room, uh, those two, especially the, the lawyer, Senator Leila de Lima, uh, we all know, of course, that the right to defend uh, human rights arises from the declaration of uh, HRDs, right? And, and mostly around the right to defend uh, the rights of individuals is about what, how we do it is without being afraid of the consequences, consequences of doing it. And this is exactly what happened to Senator Laila de, de Lima. You know, she fought really hard in terms of uh, promoting the rights of human rights defenders and she exposed the current government without fear. But in the end, in the end, she got imprisoned, she was harassed and she continues to be surveilled. So therefore, this is one of the areas that we're particularly um, uh, keen to, to look into in terms of the defenders, where we say that the defenders are not just, there's no standard in terms of defining a, a human right defender. Uh, it's not just a plain category. There's a di diversity of defenders. Now, there are environmental justice defenders. We, there are women human rights defenders. There are indigenous peoples defenders. And there are quite a lot of different contexts facing um, all of uh, the HRDs in different barriers. And, and there's, um, because of the barriers that they have, they, the levels of recognition and solidarity are often um, being, uh, are, are being violated and are, are collapsing. Um, and this is exactly what happened as well to Senator De Lima and, and many of the environmental justice uh, activists that I know of from many years ago. Um, so yeah. Next slide, please. Um, one more minute, is that possible, Mai? Maybe I can fast forward to the next slide. Okay. Uh, I guess what would be interesting, interesting for me to share are some of the stories of our work uh, across, across the world. There are four interesting stories that perhaps would be interesting to, uh, to would be interesting to share. We have, um, Successful stories, um, um, and I, I guess one of the first things that I can share is the, uh, the video contest that we had in Indonesia. Um, and I'm sure that most of our colleagues and comrades in Indonesia would know about this. We organized a public con contest to raise awareness about women human rights defenders during the International Women's Day in Indonesia. And this virtual activity 
was partic had participants from all over Indonesia, from Java, Sumatra, West Kalimantan, uh, Maluku, uh, Papua. And uh, together with um, our partner organization, IWE, uh, it really, uh, uh, it really uh, highlighted and showcased what's happening in the, in, with the women in Indonesia. And together with the contestants, we were able to, to highlight the different issues and sectors across in the Indonesia and, and share their stories. And because of that workshop, because of the video and also, also of the workshop, a fantastic community get together was um, enhanced around the well-being of women as they fought for their rights in Indonesia. Uh, another story that I could share perhaps is the defense of the river in, um, in Bahia, uh, which uh, this, is, this was in uh, Brazil. In 2021, we provided support for the setting up of environmental protection measures to a group of defenders who faced risks while protecting the five springs of river in the Pardo River. We also offered our protection training and risk management expertise to 25 defenders from the communities of Formosa uh, who are protecting five springs of the river. And due to this, you know, uh, we really was, were able to reach out to not only individuals, individual community, uh, individual human rights defenders, but to a collective of community partners who saw the value and also were quite um, uh, happy with the training that we, we, we gave during that period. I would like you to be, perhaps skip uh, through the next slide. Go to the next, to the resources. One slide back. Yes. Um, very interestingly, perhaps uh, you, I, I'm going to paste uh, on the chat um, uh, the website where you can, uh, you can access some of our resources, which are around uh, tools. We have policymaker tools. These are tools for policymakers on trial observation. Uh, you might be interested to, to have a look at this, as Senator, maybe Senator Leiden Lima we can work in partnership perhaps in the future as well. We have defenders tools. Uh, these are manuals, publications, and facilitator guides, guides. We also have protection manuals. It's a series of protection manuals uh, for HRDs. And we have e-learning. These are online trainings for security and protection management for defenders. And finally, we have uh, on the top, I, I, really, I, I really did it on purpose, to mention it the last, it's we are very happy with this tool. It's a public tool that can be used to facilitate the comparison, design, and evaluation of current and future public policies created for the protection of human rights defenders. And I do hope that you can have a look at this website. Uh, I, I pasted it on the chat screen. And if you would want to, to access some of our resources and are having a hard time uh, downloading them, please get in touch with me and I can send you um, the, the manuals or the documents. Thank you. Hey, great. Thanks, Mai. Uh, indeed, very interesting. And I think you, you made a very good, uh, say, uh, transition from, say, the cases and, and uh, people high and, 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 say, witnessing from their own experience and the experience in their countries to really like uh, developing tools and, and ways to uh, to protect these uh, human rights defenders. And because I think if we can very shortly summarize what has been said so far, I think we all see that uh, authoritarian, uh, say, regimes uh, and authorities are equipping themselves with, uh, say, various, uh, say, legal and semi-legal uh, tools uh, to, to tone down and even wipe out all uh, types of dissent. Uh, and in one country, uh, it's about, uh, say, anti-terror or legislation. In another country, they focus on uh, controlling the narrative in the social media. Uh, but uh, in fact, uh, we all see, observe a lot of violence uh, to harass, intimidate, and uh, even torture or kill, uh, say, uh, people and the rights defenders. 
Um, I think we all see that security forces are playing a crucial role eh, in, in uh, crashing down uh, the dissent. And uh, even if it's like public or private uh, militia, eh, uh, we see that they are uh, used, uh, in fact, to protect the interest of the elite and the, and the so-called investors. Eh? Um, protection of human rights is, uh, and human rights defenders is, of course, crucial. And uh, I think we have one, uh, say, uh, example from the Philippines where, in fact, uh, a law, a draft law is being, say, uh, uh, introduced to the Congress eh? uh, and was even approved uh, by the Congress. Um, and uh, this initiative came from uh, Senator de Lima. Eh? Um, uh, unfortunately, the senator cannot be here because she's uh, in prison. Uh, but uh, uh, fortunately, we have Jake here who can, in fact, um, represent a bit that bill, and uh, we can go a bit, we can learn more about, uh, say, the specific issues that are uh, dra drafted in this uh, draft law. Jake, you have the Thank floor. You, Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, my, my principal, Senator Laila M. Dilima, sends her warm greetings of peace and solidarity. And thanks everyone, particularly our organizers, for inviting us to join this online conversation. Um, as we all know, Senator Dilima filed Senate Bill Number 179, also known as the Human Rights Defenders Protection Act, in July 2019. Unfortunately, the bill remains pending in the Senate Committee on Justice and Human Rights, three years after the filing. No senator has introduced his or her own version of the Human Rights Defenders Act. It was only Senator Risa Ontiveros who was willing to co-author the bill in September 2019. No hearings, not even a single one, have been conducted so far. In contrast, we have House Bill Number 10576, authored by Congressman Edson Lagman, and other like-minded representatives, which was approved on third and final reading on January 17, 2022, and transmitted to the Senate for concurrence the day after the House approval. Given, however, the remaining days of sessions in the Senate, it is safe to assume that SB number 179 is as good as dead. A scenario that happened in the 17th Congress, it was also Senator De Lima who filed the Human Rights Defenders Act bill, but also there was no movement at the level of the Committee on Justice and Human Rights, which is an unfortunate development for our human rights defenders. The issue of human rights defenders being under threat was repeatedly raised in the third cycle of the Universal Periodic Review of the government before the UN Human Rights Council. We all know that. In the report of the Working Group on the Philippines UPR submission, 11 recommendations referred to the situation of human rights defenders. In these recommendations, the areas of common concern include a protection system for the HRDs, which we do not have at the present, an enabling environment to carry out their work, which we also do not have, and the adoption of a national law for the promotion of the rights of the human rights defenders. Again, we do not have that. The proposed legislation which underwent a process of consultation with stakeholders, both in and out of government. There were representatives coming from the law enforcement agencies and human rights defenders who are experts in their field, aims to institutionalize and enforce state obligations to provide protection to human rights defenders and to establish effective legal remedies for violation of the rights of human rights defenders. Of course, it is guided by the UN Declaration for Human Rights Defenders, and it is patterned after the model national law on the recognition and protection of human rights defenders developed by the International Service for Human Rights based in Geneva. Actually, the version of the Senate bill and the version of the House of Representatives bill um, are similar. We actually copied the Congress version so that there will be no problems at the level of the bicameral conference. But even that, we were still not very successful. Hopefully in the coming 19th Congress, there's going to be, uh, there's going to be another bill that would be filed 
and of course also in the House of Representatives. So what does the bill provide? Uh, I don't know if I'm going to, um, to show the PowerPoint presentation given the very limited time that we have. Uh, of course, the silent provisions, salient provisions of the bill, there are 56 provisions with six chapters. And there is a uh, statement there that the construction of the bill will always be in favor of human rights defenders. We also tried to define in clear language the following terms, human rights and fundamental freedoms, human rights defender, because there is a problem with the definition even in the Philippine context, what are human rights organizations, and what do we mean when we say intimidation and reprisal. There is a chapter there on the rights and freedoms of human rights defenders. We, had to be, we have to be very, very specific with regard to the rights and freedoms. The rights and freedoms were called from, of course, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, the ICCPR, and the ICESCR. We wanted to play, uh, put much emphasis on women human rights defenders and LGBT defenders, but in the uh, House of Representatives version, there was no mention of that, so we had to remove it. In the 17th Congress, we had those two terms. And then we would like also to emphasize in this particular bill, uh, the limitations. Of course, we know that there are limitations with regard to the implementation of whatever law there may be. Um, the, those prescribed by law in accordance with international obligations and standards, that would be one of the limitations. Reasonable, necessary, proportionate, solely for the purpose of securing due recognition and respect for the rights and freedoms of others, and meeting reasonable requirements of public order, and society's general welfare. Those were the three limitations included in the bill. And of course, again, there is a whole chapter on the obligation of the state and public authorities. We need to emphasize this. We need to remind the state of its obligations um, to respect, from, protect, and fulfill human rights. And we had to be very, very specific also in the details. And one of the things that is very unique in this particular bill would be um, the, 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 the non-use of the term or the phrase performance in the regularity, um, uh, oh no, the, what you call that? Um, there is the uh, presumption of regularity in the performance of official duties. They all would always say that. People in government would always say to defend themselves would be that they were doing the acts in the, per in the performance of their regular functions. So this particular presumption is not present in the bill. The authorities or the state should be able to prove that, um, and it's not a given, that what they did or what they have done are in the performance of their regular functions. And there is also the creation of a Human Rights Defenders Protection Committee, which is supposed to be independent and collegial, but uh, there, the chairperson as, um, as recommended would be coming from any of the commissioners of the Commission on Human Rights. And there would be members who will be nominated by several um, non-governmental organizations, including PARA, Karapatan, FLAG, and and UPL. It's attached to the CHR for only for administrative and budgetary purposes. The penalties uh, for violations of the, of the law, if passed, would be uh, three imprisonment um, without privilege of parole. I know we're going to have a difficult time in, in having this kind of a provision, but we are going to try. Uh, fine or both. It is an aggravating circumstance and there is non applicability of the probation law. So we hope that we are going to be able to, uh, to file this again in the next Congress. So given this very bleak scenario on the journey of our SB number 179 during the 18th Congress, what should be our next steps and ways forward? This is a question that we need to ask ourselves, particularly those of us from, 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 from here, from my country, from the Philippines. At the national level, of course, this one is a dream. It is absolutely vital for the Filipino people in the, this coming May elections 
to elect legislators who have a strong human rights record for a bill on HRD protection to be filed and enacted into law in the 19th Congress. This is a dream, and I hope it becomes a reality. It is likewise important for the Senate to elect genuine advocates of human rights legislations into positions of leadership in the Senate Committee on Justice and Human Rights. And it, we also reiterate that legislators must not only be qualified, but competent, not only passionate about pushing for measures that will promote and protect human rights, but as well as well versed in the legal aspect of crafting legislation so as to ensure that one more, uh, one more minute are not only cognizant of what are urgently needed on the ground. For civil society groups and organizations, we continue our advocacy on educating the, on educating the general public on the importance of protecting and upholding human rights. And we bring the conversation on the importance of human rights to the ground. If we could gather up more people who would lobby for legislative measures, creating multi-sectoral groups at the local level and at the national level to ensure that human life and human rights are not set aside as less important, more and more legislators could hear the advocates. And of course, there are also some measures and steps uh, that we recommend for the Commission on Human Rights to adopt, one of which would be um, I think they're doing this already, but there has to be an enhancement of coming up with programs that would equip government officials and employees, especially those tasked with law enforcement, to understand human rights and recognize that punishment awaits those who will dare violate human rights. And again, another important uh, role that uh, CHR could play, actually I have several, uh, I'm just limiting it to two, to ensure and continue with the documentation and segregation of data on violations committed against human rights defenders. That would be all, thank you, mercy. Thank you, uh, Karen. Um, okay, sorry, hey, sorry, sorry. Um, it's okay. I, um, yeah, with all these speakers, uh, I got also a little bit lost, but uh, I mean, very interesting indeed. And I, uh, I mean, I, I see there's still a lot of challenges eh, for the bill uh, to to really become into law, to pass into law. But um, I think we have to indeed keep pushing for it. And uh, and yeah, as you mentioned, eh, we have uh, elections uh, coming up uh, in May, eh, May 9th. So that's uh, hopefully uh, we get uh, say a more human rights friendly uh, Congress and, and Senate. Eh? Uh, we all wish that. I think uh, everybody who's concerned on human rights uh, in uh, in the Philippines and I mean and all over uh, say Southeast Asia uh, we, we really hope that uh, yeah we can get more uh, friendly human rights uh, say uh, lawmakers and, that, and I think everybody is wishing for that and it's his or own uh, country and context um, so thanks again and, and please uh, send our warm regards to the Senator de Lima and uh, yeah she can of course uh, uh, count on us and, and our support uh, in the in the future uh, for sure thanks a lot uh, jake and so we uh, we are passing to our last uh, speaker um, i hope you still have charles santiago uh, among us charles are you there yeah i can see you yes yes um, okay super welcome charles um, um, so um, yeah um, Charles is a long time, say, uh, um, activist and a long time member of AEPF. So uh, for the people who have been uh, involved in AEPF, um, you, uh, I mean, I don't really have to introduce you. We know you as, uh, say, the uh, currently uh, mem member of parliament uh, in Malaysia uh, and also as the, the chairperson of the ASEAN people's, uh, no, sorry, ASEAN uh, parliamentarians for human rights. Eh? So Charles, I give you the floor to give some, say, uh, final observations and also, I mean, you, your role as an MP, uh, what, how can you contribute to uh, help better protect the human rights defenders? Thanks, Grace. Uh, I've been sitting here since five o'clock, 4.45 to be precise. Uh, and I thought you forgot me though. <laughs> because there were, there were so many speakers, I was getting lost in the process. <laughs> but good, but good to hear so many uh, interventions uh, pointing to the fact that the democratic space has really closed and closed fast in some countries more than others though. Uh, but let's uh, be focused a bit on the role of parliamentarians and 
and whether parliamentarians are also rights defenders, and if so, what's the uh, uh, what are the attacks on the parliamentarians themselves? Now, when we uh, talk about democracy, you know, we have elections, uh, and during elections, we tell people, "Hey, look, I'm a parliamentarian." Or you know, when I become a parliamentarian, uh, the, one of our responsibilities is to defend, protect, and promote the rights of people. Whether it's abuse of power, whether it's death in custody, uh, whether it's a human rights violation, whether it's a discrimination whether it's forced labor and so on and so forth, people look up to you. People look up to you, come to you uh, to get advice, to get a sense of direction, and sometimes work with you in, to go to court, uh, to seek uh, justice uh, or access to justice or find ways to access justice uh, uh, in order to, for people to feel that, you know, their rights, that the violations are being addressed by the courts or by the government in power uh, and, and so on and so forth. So uh, we have a very difficult job in front of us, but also a very, a very interesting and a very enabling uh, responsibility. Because a lot of people, we can help lots of people. We can define rights, we can define, we can work with people. We don't work for people, yes, we work for people, yes. But in order to defend rights, we work with people to defend their rights uh, in parliament, as well as in the various different uh, local government, state governments, as well as the federal governments. Um, but in the cause of us fighting for justice, in the cause of uh, we uh, protecting, promoting the rights of people, uh, parliamentarians too come under attack. Parliamentarians too come under attack. I mean, the classic case of Senator De Lima is one big case. Uh, she's a, he's a member of the ASEAN Parliamentarians for Human Rights. And we have actually championed the cause quite a bit in the last couple of years. Uh, in fact, a couple of years, a couple of, uh, Two, three years ago, I tried to visit her in prison, and I must tell you the repercussions in Malaysia. She's now parked in a house, in a, in a home detention in Philippines. So I, uh, um, some friends of mine, uh, some of the senators in the Philippines, as well as congressmen, joined me to go and visit her to bring attention to her problem. Initially, we were given permission to visit her, but finally, when we came to the gates, they said, no, you can't visit her, and that, that was fine. Though. But when I got back, to Malaysia, it was funny. Uh, some of the Filipino migrant workers that we work with took issue with me. And they said, how can you support and protect uh, Senator De Lima? I said, what's wrong with her? He said, no, she's a drug, drug peddler. Uh, she's peddling drugs, she's doing this, she's doing that. I'm like, no, you got it wrong. This woman defends the rights of people. And she went against Duterte, and that's how she ended up in the, uh, in the detention. But look at the spin. Uh, that migrant workers have of her, at least in the case of Malaysia, uh, and in, in the migrant workers that I come in contact with in, in Malaysia, working in Malaysia. So these are the problems that we have. Uh, just for information, Chris, uh, we, we have a program in uh, the ASEAN Parliamentarians uh, for Human Rights, uh, which documents violation or harassment against uh, members of parliament in Southeast Asia, for ASEAN in particular. Uh, in the last one year, the, uh, since we started, which was in 2020, we documented uh, one uh, a member of parliament detained in prison, one, only one. But in 2021, the number went up to 91. Uh, the number went up to 91. That means 91 members of parliament in one way or the other were detained uh, and stopped doing his or her work uh, during the, uh, you know, as part of her work as a member of parliament. Now, this is something that you find uh, in different in all of Southeast Asia. In fact, every country has problems with uh, parliamentarians who are active, uh, parliamentarians who fight for people's rights. There is indigenous rights, land rights, land grabs, and so on. Every country has its problem. And of course, the top of the list would be, in this case, a uh, violation of human rights, democracy, and so on and so forth, would be Myanmar. Myanmar will definitely take the cake followed by Cambodia and, of course, uh, the Philippines. Uh, and Malaysia will come quite uh, uh, quite close. Now, in the case of um, Myanmar, uh, you have a situation where uh, the military coup in Myanmar is the most dramatic example of a wider trend of closing democratic space in the region. Uh, totally closed, absolutely closed. And members of parliament are on the run, I mean, literally uh, on the run. I mean, there's no way out of this. Uh, some of them are in prison, some of them are in forced exile, uh, some of them are in the border areas, 
but you know, at least at least from our from our uh, from our survey, 90 MPs have been in detention or under house arrest in Myanmar itself, and some of them are our members. Uh, so this tells you that members of parliament are also a target. A target. Here we talk about you know, um, and the target is not only in Myanmar. In Myanmar, it's also target in uh, uh, well, CNRP in in Philippines. Uh, sorry, in Cambodia. In in Myan, uh, in um, uh, in, Phil in the Philippines, uh, as well as in Malaysia, we have been targeted. Targeted. Now I have two cases pending against me, uh, two sedition charges against me. One that will come to trial end of this year, and also one that the case management will start uh, in on the 28th of this month of March. Uh, and uh, the charges against me are the most ridiculous charges you can ever find. But this is brought uh, brought by a religious leader close to government, uh, close to the government of the country, and close to the religious elite of this country, but who is an Indian national, and who actually created havoc in India, and now, now doing havoc uh, in, in, a, in, in, a, in a multiracial country where uh, religious issues are very contentious and very controversial. So he has actually brought two charges against me, uh, and also other MPs as well, other MPs and also uh, state assembly men and women. So you can see, that we, in doing our work as members of parliament, trying to uphold the constitution of the country, trying to uphold the principles of democracy, human rights, uh, in the context of a shrinking environment, shrinking democratic space, are also under attack. It's also under attack. Um, and therefore, uh, this, is a, this cuts across. This cuts across the entire region. So we, we have actually come out very strongly. The ASEAN parliamentarians for human rights have come out strongly against the Duterte government, uh, among a whole lot of other issues, but also uh, Senator Delima's uh, continued detention. I think this is this year also is extended. We came out of the statement uh, in solidarity with Senator Delima. Uh, we, we are very strong on Myanmar, uh, as well as on Cambodia. Uh, in fact, we are so strong on Cambodia that uh, that the, pr the Prime Minister Hun Sen himself has targeted the ASEAN parliamentarians for human rights. Though. Uh, and we have been raised a number of uh, ASEAN meetings as all these problematic uh, and you know left-leaning MPs. That's the problem, left-leaning MPs, and they should be targeted. This is something that we have to deal with. So, so whether it is, uh, 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 we are just like everybody else. That's the point I want to make. We are just like everybody else, uh, like the indigenous leader that our colleagues were talking about, uh, as you know, uh, uh, and all the other leaders who are under attack, on the target. Parliamentarians are also uh, targeted, uh, and this is not unique to any one country. It's you know it's happening across the board, across the board. Uh, but of course, not all parliamentarians are targeted. You have tar you have parliamentarians who are close to government. You have parliamentarians who are close to business. But for some of us who in the APHR, we are not close to business. Uh, we are critical of business. Uh, we are critical of government itself. That's what we are paid to do. That's what our mandate is. That is what is required of us. Uh, not to take sides, but to be fair, just in the work that we do, uh, that is to protect, promote the interests of people and rights and rights of people. This is what our mandate is. But unfortunately, we are unable to fulfill that mandate uh, given the various interests in the country uh, and uh, whether it is a political interest or media interest or even business interest. Uh, like for example, sometimes they come under attack for raising the issues surrounding workers, uh, especially um, uh, on, on forced labor involving migrant workers. Uh, I take up issues of refugees and migrants, and I come under attack for that. Uh, and the question is, why are you fighting for migrant workers? Why are you fighting for refugees? They are not voting for you. Though. This comes from my own constituents. It comes from my own constituents who tell me, hey, we are citizens and we vote you, but you are defending the rights of migrant workers. You are defending the rights of refugees. And I've, I've explained to them, hey, this is about what rights is all about, that it's not about you or me, but it's about all of us together. Uh, that's how we protect all our rights. So we have a lot of ex a lot of explanation to do, and lots of defending to do. But at the same time, lots of people respect what we do. Uh, and and uh, and I think uh, this is something that we do that is quite different from everybody else. We are legitimate, legitimate in the sense that Charles, we are- I'm sorry, uh, you have one more minute. Thank you. I thought I was just starting. I mean, 
<laughs> you know, we are, we take, we take the oath. We take the oath to defend. And that's what we do, to defend people, people's rights, people, people's democratic space, people's human rights, people, uh, values of community. But we come under attack just like everybody else, a lawyer, an academic, a teacher, just like all of this. With that, thanks, Chris. Thanks, Eva. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Charles. Thanks a lot for uh, this contribution. And indeed, uh, I think you made a very strong statement uh, to uh, to close this uh, this session. Um, uh, I just would like to invite uh, Shamali, uh, if you are still there, uh, just a bit to, to round up, also a bit to to to, uh, to tell us about uh, the follow up of the webinar because. Uh, I mean, webinar or organizing webinars is one thing, but I think it's also, uh, uh, say, uh, necessary that we do follow up and that we make sure that uh, there's also some action following uh, uh, after this. Uh, so, Shal, are you still there? Uh, yes, I'm here, but with a very bad connection. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you clearly. Okay. If everybody can hear me, I'll be... So, uh, once again, thank you. Thank you, Chris. And... Um, Thank you, everybody, for joining. I'm trying to actually, ah, there, it's got. I've pasted a, an email address in the link uh, in the chat, which is the right to dissent at apf.info. Uh, and I would like to invite all of you who are gathered today, uh, who are interested to work with us to carry forward our campaign on the right to dissent, to please write to this email address and tell us your name, your organization. If you don't have an organization, you're an individual working in whichever capacity, whether you're a journalist or parliamentarian or a researcher um, or a student, uh, please do so. We welcome everybody. And just again, to recap very briefly, the origin of this uh, campaign is in um, in 2019, in July, uh, the AEPF organized a meeting in Kuala Lumpur on the issue of sedition and the ways in which a fairly, how we say, non-negotiable draconian national security related laws had been being used over the last um, you know, five to six years before 2019. So we're talking about, you know, in the last decade even, uh, being used across uh, Asia and Europe to silence uh, voices of dissent, to challenge uh, voices, those who went against the status quo, whether it was neoliberalism or capitalism, whether it was a violation of human rights, whether it was extractive industry, uh, murder, enforced disappearance, and so on. And we made the connection, of course, um, that uh, neoliberalism, um, certain economic and financial types of policies, um, and uh, open capitalist policies, extractive policies were closely related to the violation of human rights. And those speaking out for justice and democratization and, and upholding laws of the land were being criminalized not only legally uh, through laws, uh, you know, through, through various types of laws, um, but also extrajudicially, they were being killed, they were being, uh, you know, disappeared, uh, threatened, harassed, etc. And what big piece here was the use of um, colonial era and former era laws on sedition, and the new new interpretations of those laws uh, in terms of what constitutes national stability, national security, and how these then become uh, people become charged as anti-national terrorists and so on. So starting from there, when we all got together in 2019 to give flesh to what we can try and do about this, came this idea that the broader issue is the right to dissent. And that the right to dissent has to be a fundamental, it is a fundamental right, because it is the formation, the foundation of the right of free, free speech, the right to association, the right to self-determination agency, and so on. And so from there, we, start, we committed as APF to build up a broad-based campaign across Asia and Europe, uh, and also in other regions. Uh, but then COVID came, and we had to have a hiatus on this. And then last year, in 2021, when we had the AEPF uh, on, online uh, in May, 
at that time we the, again the round uh, our this cluster uh, along with the parliamentarians organized a round table on the right to dissent and in advance of that we released it in country report and I, I tabby has already put the issue the, the link for that on 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 on, on our chat and then we the the, the uh, results of that uh, round table were then prepared into recommendations which were also presented and that's available on the apf website subsequently the group in our in working on migrants and refugee rights also came up with a document a foundational document on defending my, migrant and refugee rights as part of democratization and the right of free association and, and the right to dissent and so on subsequently we decided to launch a series of webinars to keep this issue alive and to get more and more people from different aspects of um, of, of our work and our lives uh, to be speaking on this issue this webinar today which has been excellent and thank you to all the speakers and to the facilitators is the last of those webinars and uh, i'm opening here i'm i'm, I'm how shall I say, making a fervent appeal to all of you who are here to please join us. Please write to us at this email address that I posted and please join us so we can then move forward uh, on building our campaign up. The next steps will be organizing a strategy meeting uh, and how we organize a strategy meeting will, of course, have to we'll have to be very careful because of um, you know these these platforms are not so secure. So we'll have to figure all that out. But first, it's important for us to know who and from what walks of life are interested to join our campaign, and we will plan accordingly. So thank you very much, and please write to us and join us. Thank you, Chris. Over for me. Thank you, Shal. Um, yeah, I think. You are the perfect, uh, say, closing guest for this uh, this uh, long webinar. Uh, long, but I think also uh, very interesting for us. And uh, um, yeah, I think I can only um, again thanks uh, say thanks a lot, thanks a lot to the to the speakers, um, the fantastic panel. Um, I think uh, it was very interesting. Uh, there was a lot of say exchanges also. Uh, uh, in the chat, unfortunately, we are not able uh, to to say to uh, to uh, go deeper into that uh, given the time constraint. But um, I'm sure we will follow up on this. Uh, like Michelle uh, mentioned, uh, we will uh, also organize a strategy meeting because I think this uh, issue is too important to just I mean keep talking about it. But we have also been to act um, and and so and see how we can uh, strengthen each other in this uh, in this struggle. So uh, once again, thanks a lot, uh, everyone, for uh, your uh, amazing contributions and also your amazing strength and your amazing inspiration uh, for all of us. Um, we will um, get back to you. Uh, we will find we will find you, and we hope we can uh, uh, still count on you uh, to continue to the work on this. And uh, Eva, do you have a closing word? That was perfect, Chris. You know, um, civic space is under attack. I think we all know it, but it has become clear once more. We are in the midst of an information war on a global scale. And that's why I just want to emphasize on the importance of us all coming together, sharing our experiences, um, sharing our best practices, uh, civil society actors and lawmakers together. Um, and, and thank you everybody for, uh, for uh, following up on this and, uh, and showing up today uh, for, this, uh, for this webinar. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.